Manuel. Manuel had developed a peculiar form of enjoyment that caused his family to repudiate him, and he lived like a bohemian in Montparnasse. When not obsessed with his erotic ex exigencies, he was an astrologer, an extraordinary cook, a great conversationalist, and an excellent café companion. But not one of these occupations could divert his mind from his obsession. Sooner or later, Manuel had to open his pants and exhibit his rather formidable member. The more people there were, the better. The more refined the party, the better. If he got among the painters and models, he waited until everybody was a little drunk and gay, and then he undressed himself completely. His ascetic face, dreamy and poetic eyes, and lean, monk-like body were so much in dissonance with his behaviour that it startled everyone. If they turned away from him, he had no pleasure. If they looked at him for any time at all, then he would fall into a trance. His face would become ecstatic, and soon he would be rolling on the floor in a crisis of orgasm. Women tended to run away from him. He had to beg them to stay and resorted to all kinds of tricks. He would pose as a model and look for work in women's studies or studios. But the condition he got into as he stood there under the eyes of the female students made the men throw him out into the street. If he were invited to a party, he would first try to get one of the women alone somewhere in an empty room or on a balcony. Then he would take down his pants. If the woman was interested, he would fall into ecstasy. If not, he would run after her with his erection and come back to the party and stand there hoping to create curiosity. He was not a beautiful sight, but a highly incongruous one, since the penis did not seem to belong to the austere and religious face and body, it acquired a greater prominence, as it were, and a partness. He finally found the wife of a poor literary agent who was dying of starvation and overwork, with whom he reached the following arrangement. He would come in the morning and do all her housework for her, wash her dishes, sweep her studio, run errands, on condition that when all this was over he could exhibit himself. In this case he demanded all her attention. He wanted her to watch him unfasten his belt, unbutton his pants, pull them down. He wore no underwear. He would take out his penis and shake it like a person weighing a thing of value. She had to stand near him and watch every gesture. She had to look at his penis as she would look at food she liked. This woman developed the art of satisfying him completely. She would become absorbed in the penis, saying, It's a beautiful penis you have there, the biggest I've seen in Montparnasse. It's so smooth and hard. It's beautiful. As she said these words, Manuel continued to shake his penis like a pot of gold under her eyes, and saliva came to his mouth. He admired it himself. As they both bent over it to admire it, his pleasure would become so keen that he would close his eyes and be taken with a bodily trembling from head to foot, still holding his penis and shaking it under her face. Then the trembling would turn into undulation, and he would fall on the floor and roll himself into a ball as he came, sometimes all over his own face. Often he stood at dark corners of the streets, naked under an overcoat, and if a woman passed, he opened his coat and shook his penis at her. But this was dangerous, and the police punished such behaviour rather severely. Oftener still, he liked to get into an empty compartment of a train, unbutton two of the buttons, and sit back as if he were drunk or asleep, his penis showing a little through the opening. People would come in at other stations, if he were in luck, it might be a woman who would sit across from him and stare at him. As he looked drunk, usually no one tried to wake him. Sometimes, 
one of the men would rouse him angrily and tell him to button himself. Women did not protest. If a woman came in with little schoolgirls, then he was in paradise. He would have an erection, and finally the situation would become so intolerable the woman and her little girls would leave the compartment. One day Manuel found his twin in this form of enjoyment. He had taken his seat in the compartment alone and was pretending to fall asleep when a woman came in and sat opposite him. She was a rather mature prostitute, as he could see from the heavily painted eyes, the thickly powdered face, the rings under her eyes and the overcurled hair, the worn-down shoes, the coquettish dress and hat. Through half-closed eyes he observed her. She took a glance at his partly open pants and then looked again. She too sat back and appeared to fall asleep with her legs wide apart. When the train started, she raised her skirt completely. She was naked underneath. She stretched open her legs and exposed herself while looking at Manuel's penis, which was hardening and showing through the pants, and which finally protruded completely. They sat in front of each other, staring. Manuel was afraid the woman would move and try to get hold of his penis, which was not what he wanted at all. But no, she was addicted to the same passive pleasures. She knew he was looking at her sex under the very black and bushy hair, and finally they opened their eyes and smiled at each other. He was entering his ecstatic state, but he had time to notice that she was in a state of pleasure herself. He could see the shining moisture appearing at the mouth of the sex. She moved almost imperceptibly to and fro, as if rocking herself to sleep. His body began to tremble with voluptuous pleasure. She then masturbated in front of him, smiling all the time. Manuel married this woman, who never tried to possess him in the way of other women.